Okay, I'll call to order the January 17th, 2019 meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission. And uh, welcome. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Singleton? Here. Bellman? Here. Kennedy? Here. Hepping? Present. Ms. E.D. Miller? Here. Nielsen? Chair Conway? Here. And Commissioner Nielsen is absent with no notification. Do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to oral communication. This is the part of the agenda where members of the public are invited to address the commission on any matters not on tonight's agenda. Do we have any pu public communication this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to the approval of minutes. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor indicate by, oh, discussion. I wasn't present. Okay. Thank you. Nor was I. <coughs> So, one, two. okay, noted. Um, of those present, indicate do your approval by saying aye. 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 Minutes are approved. With that, we'll move on to the first matter, which is the matter of 719 Darwin Street, CP 18 017171. We hear the staff report. Thank you. Um, Chair Conway, commissioners, and members of the audience. This project is at 719 Darwin Street. It's for a demolition authorization permit to demolish a single family dwelling. Um, it involves also a design permit to construct three dwelling units on a multiple residential zone property. And it also involves a tentative map as their units are actually condominiums. So uh, before we start going into the project details, I wanted to just go over a little bit of the background for this project. Um, this project was, would be generally reviewed by the zoning administrator, and it actually, in fact, was reviewed by the zoning administrator in um, 2007 and approved. Um, the permit expired in 2018, and then the applicants made a resubmittal. But why the project is essentially the same um, there's been many factors that have occurred since the 2007 approval, and that is um, the basis as to why staff's recommendation is actually for denial of the project. So uh, one of the major factors is the general plan policies and density, and since it does involve a policy decision, that is actually why it's before you, the Planning Commission. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of go over the project details go over the staff analysis, and then um, lastly go over the Planning Commission actions that can be taken. So this is an aerial of the project site, which is towards the center um, of the slide. It is on the east side, Midtown area. It's about an 8,660 square foot parcel. Towards the north and towards the west is actually the Staff of Life grocery store. Um, and this area is the parking lot for that grocery store. Towards uh, the south and then across the street and this general area are multiple residential properties. And this whole area is zoned uh, multiple residential, medium density. And it is that portion of Doran Street, I'm sorry, here's, here's Soquel along here, um, between um, Soquel and Gulf Street. And towards the center of the side is the slide is the current um, development, which is a single family dwelling that is proposed for demolition. Towards the left is a two unit uh, residential project. And then towards the right or towards the north is um, access to Staff Alive grocery store. Um, across the street uh, is a single family dwelling. Um, this has actually been uh, recently approved to be four units, two duplexes. I'm gonna go into more detail about this particular site a little later. Um, also directly across the street is um, a recently built 15 unit apartment complex. So going into some of the project details, um, here's Darwin Street. There's a common access driveway which borders uh, the Staff of Life parking access area. 
Um, there is two units kind of in a duplex-like arrangement. They do have a shared common wall. And then the last unit, this is a three-unit project, is towards the rear of the property. Um, also on the property, there's some three mature heritage um, pine trees, and those are gonna be proposed for, uh, to be retained. Moving to the floor layout, um, the, at the bottom of the slide is the first floor. Um, the two attached units are towards the front of the lot located over here. Um, each of the units has an attached garage. They also have the main living areas on the first floor. And on the second level, each of the units are two bedrooms. And then there's also, as you can see here, a common, um, excuse me, not a common study area, but study areas for each of the units. Uh, the standalone units located over here. So the size of the units ranges from 1,500 to about 1,650 square feet. So these are the elevations. This is the view from Darwin Street. Um, the lower portion of the left um, of the slide is actually the view from the common driveway. And then this would be the view from um, the ed end of the driveway. Um, both. All of the uh, um, units do have a mixture of materials. It is a combination of stucco and board and bat on the second level. Um, there's a variety of architectural detail and features. There's porches, um, fireplaces, um, bay windows and insets. Overall, the design um, will complement the area and provides consistency with the development in the area. So, as noted, this project was approved in 2007, and for the most part, um, all the site regulations, setbacks, building height, open space, um, have all been met. Um, however, again, there's been very, well, several changes that have occurred since 2007, which has led to staff's recommendation of denial. And so right now, I just wanna go over some of those factors. Um, one of the first factors was when the project was first reviewed in 2007, the city and the ordinance required a variance for any lot that was less than 65 feet in width and proposed two or more units. This particular lot was uh, 60 feet in width. The city not seeing that much development and having a lot of these infill type of lots that were this um, size in terms of lot width, um, amended the ordinance to eliminate this. Um, and that was basically because it was, they found it was a deterrent to development. Another factor and um, which shown here is the general plan policies. And they're very similar um, in terms of uh, maximizing land use densities on multiple residential sites. But if you'll see in 2019, um, there's a great emphasis on achieving the higher density of the general plan. Another factor that uh, led to staff's recommendation is that by and large, this particular site is an ideal site for an increase in density. Um, on this upper area, this kind of brown striped area, it's uh, our mixed use high density zone district. Um, here's the subject site. Um, it is adjacent to this area. Um, it is, the subject site is close to commercial properties. Um, it's in an area that is also a great transition to the multiple residential areas. And also, just in terms of its location, it's close to transit, library, shopping, um, and other services. But just going over just a little bit more of an aerial to see, um, this whole area is a higher density. Um, this area over here was uh, is in a 37 unit senior housing project. Um, closer towards this area is actually a high density zoned area. Uh, we have Library Lane located over here. And um, as I alluded to, there's the properties that are directly across the site, which are located right here. This is actually showing um, before the development of the 15 unit apartment complex and then the site that I reference as being the um, recently approved as the uh, four unit duplex. 
So again, directly across the street are these two properties, um, the duplex uh, towards the left, and then they actually constructed 15 unit apartment building. So uh, of the note, and since 2007, these property projects and properties have been developed. And in terms of density, they are at the higher end of the general plan density. And just to kind of go over, and I'm hoping to <laughs> I'm a little bit clarified in this table. So right now, 17, 719 Darwin is proposing three units. In terms of the density range, which is 20 to 30 units, um, the Darwin project comes out at 15 dwelling units per acre, which as you can see is under the 20, which is 20.1, which is at the low end of our density range. Um, if, and in the staff report we kind of went over, if they were just clearly on an unconstrained lot, if we were to go strictly by the zoning um, designation of 1,450 square feet for a multiple well, two plus bedroom type of unit, they could actually get six units. And then if they were to do um, studio one bedroom, which is not being proposed, um, eight units. Um, in terms of, as mentioned, the surrounding property, the 724 Darwin, which is um, the four units, which are three bedroom duplexes, they hit the density range at 27 dwelling units per acre. And then the 15 unit apartment complex, they're hitting it at 33 dwelling units per acre. So again, both of these are at the high end of the density range, which is consistent with what the general plan um, policies and direction is going towards. So in summary, based on those factors, based on it, it's, even though we did approve it in 2007, it's been 11 years and there's been several changes. I think the main thing, um, you know, there's been ordinance changes, the recent construction, and again, we're, we're in, in the middle of a major housing crisis that not only affects the city, but also, you know, statewide. So in terms of a recommendation, that is um, the basis is why we're recommending denial. Um, the project at three units is under density, and as kind of included in the staff report is, uh, you know, the main general plan policies that um, support actually our recommendation. Um, the Planning Commission could approve this as a three unit project. Again, it was approved in 2007, but the current general plan policies and direction that the city's going towards, we're, we're not able to find a policy to support it actually being, you know, three units, which is again under the general plan density. Um, if, if, they, if you were to go that direction, we would need assistance in finding which policies would be applicable. And then the other um, direction that the Planning Commission could take would be to continue this for redesign. Um, with this, the property owner hasn't completely ruled it out, but we would probably, um, and they would probably would like to have some direction as to the number of units that would be something that the commission could support. So with that, that's the end of my staff report. Available for any questions. Great, thank you for that report. Do commissioners have questions of staff at this time? I have one question. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify, so the general plan guideline for density in this area is the 20 to 30 acres, units per acre. Does our um, zoning ordinance not meet that? Are we deficient in recommending those densities? Well, and with this project at three units, yes, it doesn't meet that. And I think the other thing that we're looking at, especially in, in terms of direction, it's adjacent to the mixed use high density. And so this is an ideal transition property. So you'll, you see it's the two proper projects that are on the opposite side of the street that we recently approved is definitely at the higher end. Uh, the 15 unit apartment complex was actually at 33. So I guess my rephrasing my question. So if I'm looking at the RM zone zoning code, right? And it says 1,450 square feet per unit, you divide the lot area. Do we specify that you need to meet the 20 units per acre or you just, it, it comes out to 5.9 in this case, right? As far as number of units. Right, right. Which would meet the 20 units per acre. They're proposing three. Is there nothing in the 
RM zoning ordinance that says we need to meet that? I'm just, I'm looking for where, where does somebody find that? So um, there are several places where that can be found. One, um, the, um, let me start with, because the zoning ordinance has a minimum um, lot area per unit, um, if you're going under that general plan density, you're gonna be meeting that minimum lot area per unit, you just got substantially more. So they're meeting that zoning ordinance criteria. What they're not meeting is there's a finding as part of the design permit that specifies that the decision-making body needs to establish that the project as proposed is consistent with the general plan. And to be consistent with the general plan, we look at that density range and other applicable policies. You know, there may be an ability to um, be flexible outside of that density range if you are um, conforming with the zoning ordinance requirements and relying on other policies. In this instance, the policies actually state that um, density is encouraged um, one, and uh, two, um, they're below that range. So at 15 dwelling units per acre, they're substantially below the minimum density range called for in the general plan of 20 to 30 DU per acre. And the general plan policies say you should hit the top end of that range. And so we haven't found any policies that uh, would support the project as proposed. Okay, yeah, that clarifies it for me, thank you. And then one other question on the options for deny or um, okay. submit it for further redesign. What are the differences there? Does the applicant still have the option to go straight to city council? Does one afford that and another doesn't? What, what are those, how do those play out? Right, and I think that's kind of one of the reasons we brought it to the commission for them to also understand kind of which direction, you know, your, the commission might go. And to see, so if you did a denial as the project as it is, they could just take it right to council without having to do additional changes. Mm -hmm. But based on the deliberation here, they might want to do the redesign. So that's kind of also why we brought it up to the commission since it was. So my question is, so if we chose the redesign option, did, are they still allowed to just go to city council or they need to meet the redesign first? They do not have an option to appeal a continuance for redesign to the council. If they wanted to, um, if they want the option to go to the council, then they would ask that you uh, take action on this item and um, either uh, recommend or either approve the item and they would be okay with it or deny the item and then they would have the option to bring it to council. If you uh, elect to continue, to redesign, then that's not something that they could appeal. You would need a decision um, in order for them to appeal it. And so that's a question that you should pose. I, I would recommend that you pose that question to the applicant based on uh, the direction that you uh, feel you're heading. And then the applicants can make that determination as to whether or not um, they would prefer to um, look for a redesign with additional units or um, present the project to the council upon appeal. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions before we hear from the applicant? Okay, at this time, I'd like to invite the applicant to um, address the commission. You'll have 15 minutes. You don't have to use it all. <laughs> I won't use all the 15 minutes, I promise. This is Tom Thatcher. Uh, good evening. Um, I designed this project back in 2007 uh, as a very young man. And um, uh, it's strange to be here um, because if we had designed a six or eight unit project 20 or 30 years ago, we would probably be uh, wanting six or eight units and would be um, approved at three. But it's kind of, things have kind of turned around 180 degrees here as an aside. Um, as the Staff report states uh, we're here because the permit that was issued in 2007 expired uh, last summer. The owner, John Newman, who is here, uh, asked me to resubmit the plans and uh, in hope of getting uh, the permit reissued. Um, due to uh, some miscommunication, and I will just leave it at miscommunication with planning staff, 
uh, we were under the impression that we needed to, when we need, when we resubmitted, that we needed to um, bring the project up to meet current codes. And there was wasn't really much to do architecturally, but the, as you folks know that things have changed a lot with drainage systems and back in 2007 it was a very limited drainage system and so we um, got Ifland engineers involved and they did a brand new um, drainage system at considerable, considerable expense. Um, that required a new landscaping plan and there was some of my time and there was over $6,000 of city fees. Needless to say there was a lot of money put in to read the resubmittal of this project. We also posted it last fall. And um, and then after all of this was done, we got a letter from the, that's when we got the letter from the, the city saying that they're not gonna support a three unit project. They wanted six units. Um, so this was obviously a shocker for the client. Um, and, uh, so um, he has made it clear to me that he doesn't have the, the resources and the time to go back through the whole process again. Um, so we're looking to, we're asking you to either approve or deny this project. He has no intention of wanting to go back through and design a brand new six unit project. It would be kind of a start over situation for him. Um, we don't at all disagree with staff's analysis that we are in the middle of a housing crisis and that six to eight smaller units um, would be appropriate for this site. I haven't done any, I have done zero design, um, put in zero design time to figure out what a six to eight unit project would look like on this, on this property. It would undoubtedly be a rental project of some, some type. Um, and even uh, potentially more profitable, uh, who knows. Um, but should he decide to redesign, um, he also uh, runs the risk that um, he could encounter some neighborhood resistance. Um, we didn't get any resistance back in 2007, zero. And when we posted it in this last fall, there was no, as a three unit project, there was no, no resistance. Uh, there was no neighborhood in, in, input. But who knows, with uh, some neighborhood opposition and our new city council, uh, it's not out of the question to think that he could re redesign this project to six units and get some neighborhood opposition and um, resubmit and then have to deal with neighborhood opposition and a city council that says, we like a smaller, um, um, or we, we like the, the sm a smaller uh, density project and he'd have to redesign again. I mean, that's conjecture, but we, we don't know what's gonna happen. So we would like to get approval or denial for this project um, and um, hope that, uh, you know, you can um, see fit to approve it um, and then let um, uh, Mr. Newman decide what he wants to do with it, whether it's to sell the, the project or um, a much smaller percentage chance of uh, uh, redesign and, and try to sell it with a six unit project. Um, if I were a betting man, I would bet that you guys are gonna be seeing this project come back to you as a six unit project or something denser, who knows. Um, but um, we'll have to wait and see. So that's it. And any questions? But uh, thank you. Do commissioners have questions of the applicant? Commissioner Masidi Miller. I have one. Um, as I understand it, the project was approved and the permits expired this last summer after a long period of time. Uh, why did the uh, owner uh, allow the permits to expire? Well, that's a little confusing for me because I was under the impression initially that he let it expire, that he could have continued that, but then I read in the staff report that there was a time limit on, on that and that it automatically expired. Maybe Nancy can, can answer that. Mm -hmm. um, during the time it was approved, it actually is all planning permits are, there's a certain expiration date. And in this case, it was three years. So it was first set to expire in 2010. 
Um, that was also a period of time when there was an economic downturn. And so the state stepped in and passed several assembly bills to uh, extend any permit that had a tentative map um, additional years. So there was four such assembly bills, state bills. And so the actual, with all those extensions, the permit would actually expire in June 2018. And so Mr. Newman did come in periodically to check on it um, several times. And, but unfortunately, the, the June 20, 2018 date came and went. There was no building permit application submitted. And so it expired. But yeah, typically a planning permit usually just goes three years because to take into account any changes in regulations, changes in building code, changes in general plan policies. So in this case, it, it was, it's a quite lengthy time. So, but that, that's basically why you know, it went that long and then expired. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a follow-up? So I'm, based on what you're telling me, or what, what you're saying, is that uh, Mr. Newman was aware that his permits had been extended due to state law changed, or due to state law? And yes. He was informed of that and ch had checked in with you periodically from, excuse me, from 2007 until he discovered that his permits had expired. Correct. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. Anybody else have questions for the applicant? I'd like the identical question, but mm -hmm. so could he have extended it more if he'd wanted to? No, pretty much it was we were relying on the tentative map extensions. It's a planning permit, you know, pretty much a, it was accompanying that tentative map, which extended it. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for the applicant? No, nope. with that, thank, thank you very much. With that, I will open the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, I thought you were speaking for the applicant. Welcome. I am John Newman, uh, owner of the property. Uh, I am also a Korean War vet and uh, 86 years of age, and my wife of 59 years is here. And I mention that because part of the option is to seek possibly a continuance. And uh, the uh, circumstances have to be encouraging in order to do that under these circumstances. My wife uh, is confined at this time to a wheelchair, so we're looking to uh, sell the property and do not intend to be part in participating in uh, developing to any extent. But I should say that uh, the uh, staff report eloquently paints a picture for denial in its 15 pages, which I gave fairly deep reading to, and yet it was silent definitely silent about the fact that there was no such explanation or being pointed out to us when we began this process uh, that the restrictions in the general plan would be anything but supportive of the plan. We have two very old buildings, maybe built in the 40s, and it didn't ever serve a purpose to put monies into them because I felt the properties uh, would be much better for development in the long run. And we had, of course, as mentioned, a 15-unit property development project went up right across the street. So while the staff report is emphasizing a denial, we were never informed that there might be a possibility of denial, so we approached this whole project thinking that we could follow the directions and be successful. So in my background, I spent seven years in Millwood, Washington, a suburb of Spokane, as the chairman of the planning commission. And uh, our compensation in those days was uh, to work for nothing. So one evening I introduced a motion to increase compensation for those of us who were doing this work. 
It was passed unanimously. We continued to work for nothing thereafter. So public service is its own benefit and rewards. And I felt it was very useful. And in my term as a chairman, I tried to exercise fairness with good consideration to the people for whatever issues that would arise to us. And uh, I learned to respect those who came and we tried to make judgments that fit those standards and to be pa uh, patient and uh, exercise equity in the judgments that we made. So as we moved along, uh, Jeannie and I uh, obtained a uh, home equity loan early in 2018 in order to substantial enough to foresee the uh, expenses that we were going to have. So we came to the, uh, the uh, division in the road. You, can, you come to an optional, and we accepted it, as Yogi Berra once said. And we decided to move forward in an effort to get this project approved. And the three unit project, and we have a wonderful uh, plan that's uh, sitting there. Uh, Thatcher was a good part of it. And uh, Ifland, we hired excellent people, very familiar to the planning folks here tonight, and uh, completed that, but it was substantial cost, and I would say it was close to $40,000 that we'd spent. We arrived finally in September, the fall of this year, uh, as Mr. Thatcher has indicated, and posted the property. And uh, until that moment, there was never any indication that we were not complying with every need that the city had. We had two very old buildings. We have a very nice property. Uh, it's like a rectangular tennis court, you might say. And. Uh, we had no clue that this might not be approved in the ultimate findings. So the plan ultimately was approved and it was posted without any negative comments. And yet I have uh, one of the uh, copies that I have here was uh, from uh, Nancy Concepcion dated October 19th in which uh, we posted it without comment. And then at the bottom of this report, uh, mid-October, mid toward the end of October, it said that it's possible that they would like to have six and possibly eight units on it. And that to us was stunning. There was never any indication that that would be possible when we uh, undertook this project. And uh, even though it could be of some help and assistance in marketing this property. Uh, the fact that we have been approved for the three unit condominium project uh, with the tentative map, we felt would be an enhancement if we went to the marketing stage of this, which we think hopefully may be uh, in April, uh, February. And uh, so we had to absorb that, and we've had some meetings with uh, Mr. Marlatt and Nancy Concepcion, and uh, even some notice and commentary from Mr. Butler about this project. And to suddenly find ourselves with the rug swept out from under us is a very hard reality. So I went down Monday and got the uh, report from Nancy, and uh, the conditions are, of course, uh, a continuance or approval or denial. And we feel it is a travesty, perhaps a miscarriage of justice if we're not allowed to emphasize our uh, hopes that we could receive an approval as approved uh, by the uh, council and move forward and market the property with that, even knowing that the possibility six or more units would also be very attractive 
but we think we deserve to have that. So I asked Nancy if there would be any mitigation for all the monies we have spent to arrive at this point. And she said, no, if you applied for, uh, this was Monday, if you had another project, you would start from scratch with the expenses. So it doesn't make too much sense to think about asking for a continuance to be involved with another uncertain application to the planning people, which could be shot down again. And so we see two possibilities here. Approval, we know there is the denial, but throughout that denial, there was never any suggestion that there would be a possibility we probably would have gone for the five or six units and have our tentative map for that. So I think we urge that careful consideration as I was taught to do in Washington State as the planning commission, commission person, that in fairness, I think that we should be allowed to market this with the approval of the three unit project, as well as the potential enhanced for development with the six or eight unit possibilities. And uh, I think that's uh, what I would have to say, and I appreciate this time to address the commission. Thank you. We appreciate your comments and your insights into the history. Does anybody have questions of the property owner? Yes. Uh, I guess it's more of a question <coughs> for staff, actually. I'll hold that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes, I have a question. Mr. Miller. I have a question. Um, uh, Mr. Newman, I'm, your uh, summation, I guess, was left me a little bit confused. So as I understand it, and, and, and maybe this is a question also for staff, but as I understand it, the Planning Commission doesn't have a basis for approving your project. There's no, there's no basis in current general plan findings for us to approve the project as it's, as it's currently submitted. So we would struggle with approval. Uh, I, I'm speaking maybe for myself. I would struggle with approval. Um, then the second option would be to deny your project, then you could appeal this, the decision to the city council. The other option is to, that we would ask for a continuance for a redesign. And based on what you said, just to, just to make so it's clear for me, it sounds as though you're not interested in continuing this matter for a redesign. You'd love to have an approval if we can figure out how to approve your project. Yes. And if we can't approve your project, you would then like us to deny the project so you can appeal it directly to city council. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to say though that uh, the uh, general plan exists at this point like a large cloud looming over us as occurred last night in this area. And it was not even present when we began this discussion and it looked like the three units surpassed the two much older units that I had on the property and that were sched are scheduled for demolition. And we think that the three units is a good plan. It's a solid one and it's attractive. And uh, what's hard to get past is the fact that, that we spent all of this money to get to this point to find that our efforts uh, have been fruitless. I should add that I have a roofless structure on the property that uh, has been there for the last year and a half, un unable to, uh, to rent. And Mr. Gervasoni from the planning has come out and we have a permit for that little tiny 300 square foot ADU, which was considered illegal because it was three feet next to the adjoining property at Staff of Life and it needed to be five or more feet away and that was put in maybe in the 40s. But they waived those kinds of things. And we spent maybe 10,000 to get a permit which is existent in the files here with the city, B160567 and would be, as I understand it, renewable in February 2019. So, all along, why did they allow us to do these, make these applications? Why did we lay, were told that the general plan was not a factor in the early times of our approaching to make this plan happen? And all of a sudden now it's clear, and I accept the conclusion of uh, 
the staff report that suggests the property needs larger, bigger number of units to be on it. But in fairness, uh, again, that word is a tough one. It's not fair that we were just misled in a sense. And why was that? Because I don't think planning staff knew that these relationships with the general plan were going to be as formidable as they have become now, but not back in February, March, and at the time when we uh, received our uh, home equity loan. So I just think in fairness, uh, I would urge the, the uh, commission to approve this plan. And I think that the general plan considerations are far different for, at this moment than they were and I like those, the change in their direction, but at that time, why did we keep going through this with all the, that expense to arrive at this moment and then say the general plan was always there and the, uh, the need to expand and have more units is uh, very prominent at this point, but it had nothing to do with the way we approached at the beginning of this uh, effort. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we will thank the applicant for their uh, insight and open the public hearing. At this time, members of the public are invited to address the commission on this matter. Um, there's, you have up to three minutes to speak. And seeing... Uh, Ask you to please sign your name and uh, uh, on over beside Tess and introduce yourself. Um, my name is Clark Knapp, and I've been, been involved with this family for many, many years. But what I find is a travesty here is having been led down this path and we are trying to find a way to support this project, well, it has been supported all the way through. And you should honor what commitments this council and this staff has made through the years. Um, I don't see where this is inconsistent with the plan. It is adding more housing to the area. It doesn't meet any neighborhood objections. Um, and it still could come back to you as a project that may come with six or eight units, or it may come with three units, but I think it's all for the good of the community. So I would hope that you would find it in your hearts to stick with your word and honor and approve this project. Thank you, any questions of me? Thank you for your comments. Good evening, uh, my name is Uwe Rivas. I am the real estate agent for John Newman. Uh, I just want to clarify a couple of timelines here. And that is that um, John first approached me during the summer that he wanted to, uh, he realized the permits had, had lapsed and that he wanted to uh, go forward and, and try to get them renewed. Um, and that was during the summer and I, in August, Tom Thatcher approached the city with wanting to go ahead and reapply. So it was from the summer to October, middle of October, after they said, let's go ahead and reapply, that he spent all that money. And then, so two months later, it got denied. So that's the big question is that timeline that uh, we've been referring to this evening. Um, and the other thing, uh, there was a question about why did he let it lapse? Well, you know, the economic downturn, it wasn't a viable project. And uh, since then, his wife has been ill and he needs the money to take care of her. So that's something also that definitely should be taken into consideration. Thank you. If there are any questions. You, uh, it's not normal to ask questions, but you might know better than staff. 
if we were to find some way to approve it, mm -hmm. how could you market it as a three unit project? We wouldn't. Because it couldn't, whoever bought it couldn't go forward with a three unit project. If, if you were to approve it, you would, if you were to. If we were to find some way to. to some way to get it approved, then we could market both ways. Mm -hmm. It would be a, a, have a much better appeal to Thanks. prospective buyers. You're, you're, you're buying uh, potential buyers expands. I see, so you'd have two options, two even, options. even if one might never work, you right. know, as the laws might change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other members of the public? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and return this for deliberation of the commission. Uh, and would anybody like to start? Mr. Spellman. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to appreciate Mr. Newman and all he's put into this. I think we're we're at a you know point in time where policy is changing, unfortunately, uh, for this project. Um, I, I listened to what you said. I think the for me personally, the timeline is a difficult one. Certainly, in 2007, when this was approved, there's a different. Uh, climate for approval for three units versus units that would be at a higher density. Um, and we haven't tested today what the market would, would say to three units versus more units. But from a policy standpoint, the city uh, has directed us to uh, encourage and, and promote a much higher density use on this site. Um, from what I'm listening, you, you resubmitted that project uh, at the end of the summer or, or early this fall. And through the process of review from the city, their comments came out that, in fact, the, the higher density is a basic requirement essentially for this site moving forward. It's unfortunate that that comes as new news uh, to you and um, having to essentially redesign and pay all the fees and pay all the design and engineering to then come up with the new plan. Um, but that's, I think, the, the situation we're in. And I think I, I have a hard time finding a way to support just the three unit project. Thank you. Anybody else have comments at this time? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump yes. in. I, I'm, uh, I believe Mr. Uh, Commissioner Spellman and I share a similar, I appreciate the quandary that's presented here tonight. I certainly am, um, Filled with empathy and compassion for the predicament that Mr. Newman finds himself in, but I don't see how the Planning Commission can make a finding for approval based on the uh, current general plan. I mean, it's it's just not going to be possible tonight. Um, so my suggestion, and this, I guess if, I, if you're looking for a motion, not Chair quite, but uh, Conway, I would make a motion that we deny mm -hmm. the project and allow the applicant to. Um, appeal the decision of the Planning Commission for denial to the City Council. It seems like the most expeditious thing for uh, resolving the conflict. Um, he's not interested in a um, continuance for redesign. So I, I don't know what other option we have here tonight. That's my thought. Somebody want to second that motion before we'll deliberate further? I think we second have- Second that motion. Okay. Um, so we do have a motion to deny on the floor. I think we have a lot more discussion to pursue. Sorry. Um, I know I'm, I myself am interested in um, probing at what it would mean to continue. Um, I, I think it's clear, I agree with the commissioners that have spoken so, so far, that first of all, it is regrettable to find out that uh, the project as proposed, in 2000, proposed and approved in 2007 is no longer viable in the community. Um, it is also true that it is elapsed um, that that application did lapse, and you had to be, a, you know, um, reapply um, with the same project with some updates to um, meet some current standards. Um, that said, the situation has changed dramatically, both in the recognized community need and also in the city's mandate um, to um, identify opportunities um, to meet a housing need. Um, I agree that it isn't possible for us to, I don't see how we could make a finding to approve this project. It might be worth noting though, that um, the 
what could come forward on, on this pro property uh, can be informed by the studies that are there to date. You've done some studies, I assume a survey. You've got some value in your drainage plans and understanding of the site um, that I hope could be at least partially recouped. Um, I also note that the recognized need, especially just immediately in the area that we are most hoping for density, um, with the density bonus on that site, you could potentially have um, you know, small rental units, um, which we need very badly. Uh, that could be um, uh, really enhance the value of the property, and I hope that it would. Um, and uh, so, one of the things that I that I wondered is, rather than to deny, I've wondered if um, there was a continuance. What it re what we really are doing, um, acknowledging that the property is going to be marketed for sale soon as soon as next month, um, marketing it with a continued application. If there's any value in that in terms of original application fees, is there any, I mean, obviously what we would be, or it, it appears that what we would be recommending is um, a redesign with additional units. Um, continue, is there any value in terms of an application has been submitted, the initial application fee um, it, does any of that transfer to a new, just wondering? So <clears throat> um, if the application were to be denied um, and it were appealed to the city council and denied, that's very clear that, uh, you know, done that application done. is done. Right. Um, certainly uh, the, uh, with a uh, continuance, um, there, uh, We've, we've gone through a lot of expenses with this in terms of the review and the preparation of this staff report. However, um, with the continuance, um, we would be willing to look at um, charging the Delta um, for the additional review. So there is a value in that. Um, you know, there, um, there would be additional costs to us in terms of reviewing essentially what amounts to a revised uh, application. Um, and the routing of that. Um, however, there would be that value in terms of uh, uh, looking at the difference between what is a three unit project or what is a, uh, a five unit project or a six or whatever it may be. And, and I do wanna agree with the architect, Mr. Thatcher, that uh, you know, he hasn't looked at uh, what um, could be accommodated on the site and how, and neither have staff, we haven't been presented with any of those options. and so. We don't know how many units um, could ultimately be accommodated here, but we do believe that substantially more than the proposed number of three could. And um, we also didn't find that way to make the uh, general plan um, uh, conformance finding. But back to your original question, yes, there could be some value, particularly recognizing you know the uh, sequence of events and um, uh, looking to um, uh, still uh, make sure that we're addressing some of the additional costs that we have to uh, uh, charge at least for the delta between the three unit project and however many units they submit for. Sure, understood the department's costs are real costs and generally charged through an at cost account. Um, and I guess that's that's what I was getting at is um, wondering if it, if there is just some potential of a recognition of value and also that it, um, if it could if it's going to be marketed for sale next month that there is some guidance about what the city would expect um, going forward for a future buyer. Um, we know that there's going to be a minimum. The maximum would need to be explored through a new design. So I guess that's my my question there. Are there any other comments? Yeah, Commissioner Pitt. Um, with regard to the minimum and the maximum, Nancy, the table that you showed was, are we looking at six to eight or is that not known? To the 20 to 30 for this lot gets you to six to eight or is that not that clean? Could be well, more? Ba based on the zoning, it, it comes out to like six units with uh, two plus bedrooms and then eight units of its studio or one bedroom units. 
And part of, you know, in the context of the general plan, this is a pretty unconstrained property. It's a fairly standard shaped lot, level, no really notable vegetation or it's, it's on the periphery. So it could go a higher density based on the general plan policy as also in this location about being a transitional property. So with um, that said, so like for example, if it was six units with a two bedroom, that's a 31 dwelling units per acre, which is the high end of this medium density residential. But again, with the emphasis on trying to encourage additional development on unconstrained properties, you know, it, it could go higher. It would probably be encouraged because the mixed use high density is at 55 dwelling units. This one at 30, you know, it, something in between would be ideal, but you know, that, that's where it kind of gets into, you know, putting in all the setbacks, the open space, parking, but um, I don't so, know if that helps answer it. And, and the general plan, if, if they were to fall within that range of 20 to 30 dwelling units per acre, um, they would be at, um, at four to five units. Um, the six units would put them at um, slightly over the um, 30 DU per acre. However, there are other general plan policies that can support that. I'll read you a, a brief clip of the uh, general plan in the um, land use chapter speaking to residential densities. Each residential designation establishes a maximum and minimum development density. A site's density must be at or above the minimum unless constraints associated with the natural environment require a lower density. A site's density must not exceed the maximum requirement except as otherwise permitted or encouraged by policies and actions in this plan. And so um, there could be the potential to um, increase above that uh, five units. Um, that would have to be um, met with general plan policies to support that. Um, and the zoning would support that. So uh, in looking at that, we have a myriad of policies that support um, development and locations that um, uh, reduce um, vehicle miles traveled where people can walk to um, meet their everyday needs. And this particular location is, is um, situated um, in a very walkable location, probably one of the most walkable locations outside of our downtown with access to three grocery stores within, three full service grocery stores within very close proximity to restaurants, to entertainment, to um, job opportunities. And so um, this is a location where other general plans uh, policies um, could support higher densities and they would also be supported by the zoning. So there, there is the potential to go um, substantially more units than three. And do, do you, um, we're trying to throw, we're trying to help the applicant um, recognizing that the, the disappointment and cost and ne negative outcome for them relative to what they wanted. So we're trying to help them. In your sense, is it worth some um, gesture from the planning commission that'll help them shop this thing? Do you think that's worth it? Uh, some gesture in terms of uh, a continuance or? Yeah, or some narrative that goes with the denial that helps them say, well, see, this is what, um, I wanna buy this parcel, look, at this is what the city wants to see. Well, um, I think the if the Planning Commission chooses to go the denial route, uh, the record will reflect that the city is looking for uh, additional units and, um, and, and so that would be uh, apparent to any future buyer that, um, uh, that at this point, um, the the three unit project was deemed to be too low. And so in order to meet the general plan density range at minimum, you would need four and to meet the other applicable policies, you'd be looking at five plus. Well, a sophisticated buyer can figure that out. So is it worth us going through the machinations here? We just, you, you, you could include that with your denial statement, uh, letting the record reflect that uh, a, uh, uh, proposed project with additional units would be looked upon more favorably. Sure. And of course we would go through as, as uh, Nancy indicated and make sure with whatever application came through that they're meeting all the applicable criteria. And so, you know, it's not a given that they could get six or eight units out here. We'd be looking at all those other yeah. criteria, open space, parking and so forth, but we do believe more could be achieved. 
I'm in support of the motion when we right. get there. I just have a few more points of clarification too. So w when you read that last general plan component about getting above the density, one of the things that's in there is that it needs to meet the minimum density as well. Yeah. That's correct. Was that part of the general plan in 2007 when this was approved? I don't know if that specific statement was. I would expect that it was. Um, Nancy was here at the time. She might be able to chime in. I would expect that it was. I think the, um, the distinction there was that at the time when this came through under the prior general plan, there was that requirement for a variance. Um, and as you all know, in, in um, determining uh, the outcome of variances, those have fairly strict findings. And so um, those sometimes uh, were at odds with one another is the ability to make those findings for the variance. Um, and so that I believe contributed to the, uh, the 2007 approval in that there was some level of inconsistency and in, 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 in some respect and urging to um, go with lower densities at the time because of the requisite variance findings associated with having more units on a parcel like this given the, the lot width. And I'll ask Nancy if she had anything to add. And, and that basically is the basis. You know, back then in 2007, it wasn't many development projects coming in. This was a project that supported or proposed three units. The density was 3.8 with the variance requirement, you know, and making those findings, um, we found that that would be a, a sufficient project because in, also in terms of the current development at that time, the adjacent properties essentially were two plus units. So having a three unit pro project <coughs> adjacent to the more, you know, transit corridor, more commercial area, that seemed consistent. Right. But now given the change in the development in the area, now, you know, that's also the new thing that we're, well, another factor sure. in consideration. So my, my point is more about then communication, and I think we're gonna be put in this position moving forward more frequently. This project's pretty unique. The approval's been around for a while, but if he went and did re-engineering for the same project because of new civil and, you know, water drainage components, this could have been a very short conversation that said, you know what, there's three units, is really not gonna fly. So going through that, all that extra work for what you have already in place is really not necessary. Now, I don't know the details of how any of that went down and if somebody walking up to the counter today in an RM zone district, you know, the first question that's, or the first answer they're gonna get is, here's the density that you need to meet for that lot. They can't come in with a three unit project that doesn't meet the density and, and they're able to submit and go through the process and find out after all of that, that guess what, that, that's not gonna work. So it sounds like there's been some, unfortunately, you know, a project was done and then resubmitted and that piece of information about the density change really wasn't communicated until after it went through its review of that second submittal. It sounds like he had to do additional right. work even to get in the door at so that I point. Should, I should note that when we take in an application, and in this case, we pretty much had enough conceptual plans to process it as it is from the 2007 approval. We didn't really ask for additional work to be done. Um, you know, this is a pretty flat level lot. There was really no concerns with drainage at that time. So I think the miscommunication was they went forward and got that work done. We did not request it or ask for it for the resubmittal. Okay. Um, there are, however, substantial upgrades to you know, stormwater regulations, for example, that sure. have occurred since 2007. And so in order to meet those criteria, a additional, additional work is involved with that. And um, it, when the, uh, my understanding of the situation, just, you know, to daylight the, uh, the issue that's, you know, kind of the elephant in the room from the applicant's perspective is, is there was a communication at the counter. What do I need to do to um, uh, have a project that was um, originally approved um, 
uh, to have it approved again. And well, you need to resubmit. And so that direction was provided um, and a, a thorough analysis was not done. It was just, you need to resubmit. The applicant did take the steps to, um, to update the application to some of the current standards. And um, at uh, the initial review within the 30 day time frame of the initial review letter, when a thorough analysis of the project is done, it was identified that the general plan um, was inconsistent with that. And so, it, yes, uh, we, the point is very well taken. Um, ideally, at that initial encounter, it is identified and, um, and noted that, hey, when you come back, if you choose to submit this project, um, there are going to be some issues and uh, uh, the general plan conformance is, first, is foremost among them. Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I think given the fact that extensions are out there and things are changing, it's right. hopefully going to get easier and simpler and um, the communication back and forth will be more forthright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and in this case, I mean, it's very easy to see how um, the simple answer to the simple question is this is an expired permit. What do I do to re-up it? It's all designed. It's an attractive building. It was, you know, it was designed. In answering that, it was you resubmit. Um, so it, it's not hard to see how it happened, and it is unfortunate. Um, and especially in light of the pressure that the city is under from the state law, which we only expect is going to continue um, to build. So it's it's something that, um, you know, to be aware of. But I, I also think that whoever was at the counter answered a simple simple question um, of, the, of the process. Um, so it, it sounds like we generally have consensus that, or I'm, I'm not hearing who any, anyone who wants to move for the approval. Um, there is a motion on the floor for denial. Um, my point was that was I, I wanted to poke at, to probe whether um, there would be any advantage to the sale if there was um, an open application um, that had been continued by the Planning Commission. Um, I'm hearing that it may have potentially some, um, but maybe not a substantial enough value um, uh, to to continue rather than simply deny. Um, are there any any other clarification on that point? <coughs> Is there any other? Okay. Not on the the value, not from. Like, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, having spent some time right. looking at those drawings and understanding. Couple of questions. So ADUs are allowed if the proposed ADU amendments get approved, correct? The RM zone, which allows residential uses, could have ADUs. Are they currently allowed, or would they only be allowed with the new changes? Um, and ADU, um, well, consistency with the state law will require, this is one of those that falls into the state law category. So we can't, uh, we don't have the opportunity to deny that when it moves forward. So ADUs will be allowed. I was hearing that um, it um, will, uh, that there's already an ADU on there. Um, and I would ask Nancy, is this lot size over 10,000 square feet? No, it's eight thousand. Okay, eight thousand. So it would be one. Uh, you know, there's the provision that uh, would entertain the possibility should council choose to approve it of ten thousand square feet or more on ADUs, allow or sorry, ten thousand square feet or more of lot size, allowing two ADUs. So this would only allow one. And I was hearing uh, that there may already be one there. Mm, okay. Yeah. So that's that's, being that's a different so twist. I was thinking three units, three ADUs. It would be you could put pretty small units and not change significantly the layout of the three unit design, but that would be a minor tweak, but it sounds like there's complications there, so. Okay, so, so you're going in a partially different direction. Right. I thought you might be uh, talking about keeping the existing and adding an ADU or multiple ADUs. In that instance, you know, there, there could be something that um, could be accomplished through, a, for example, through a uh, plan development. Um, typically, you know, we've got accessory dwelling units um, with um, associated with the single family residence. Um, but we could, through a plan development, look at um, changes that would allow, uh, changes to use that could allow an ADU on a multifamily property and, and have. You don't have the square footage for a plan right. unit development, right? 
No, no, sorry. Yeah, okay. so we don't have that there either. So yeah, yeah. Um, so it, not as an ADU, it would it would have to be as a regular unit, which right. you know they they could do, but they wouldn't get some of those same benefits uh, that you get right. when you pr propose an ADU with um, you know, parking reductions and so forth. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, I I'm finding it hard to see that a redesign. A simple thing. I think it's a fundamentally different project. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. There is still some engineering work that may have some value, but um, okay. Um, any other comments? There is a motion on the floor and a second. Yeah, Commissioner. Just one last Captain. comment. I, you think we're in, marching towards a denial, and that won't satisfy the the uh, pellant. Um, I would. Um, I heard the words misled and miscommunication and sticking with your word and honor. And I think that's a very important thing to, for the city to, to consider. Um, so I'd encourage the, um, the applicants, um, the appellants to submit your comments. Um, I find the, the city staff to be um, responsible and professional and, and, uh, and receptive to where they can improve. So um, I encourage you to share that. It was just kind of vague references to how things could have been better, and I don't know staff always want to do better, so I would encourage you to submit that to them so they can improve. And if you don't think that'll be well received, please share that with the Planning Commission because that's useful for us um, to deal with matters like this in the future. So that's the only last thing I'd say other than we are giving careful consideration, I believe. So. Any other comments? With that, I will ask for a roll call vote. Commissioner Singleton? Aye. Feldman? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Pepping? Aye. Mercedes Miller? Aye. Chair Conway? Aye. Have a question? Yes. So our, our, our denial will go forward with a, a denial based on the fact that it doesn't meet the minimum That's right. requirement. So, that, so it's fully understood by the applicant in the denial that when he markets this, he can market this. It was denied because it didn't have enough units. Yes, yeah, so we, yeah. right. we can let the record reflect. Right, we can let the record reflect clearly in the minutes, in addition to the staff report, but in the minutes themselves, so that there's ease of reference. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, with the change of personnel. To anyone, I think. To anyone. Okay, as the uh, staff changes and the, uh, we'll move on to item number three on our agenda, 1720 West Cliff Drive, CP 18-0149. And I believe we have- Good evening, report. commissioners. <clears throat> Mike Barry, I'm the project planner. Arrange this stuff. Uh, so the project site, you can see here, it's an irregular lot. It is considered a substandard lot. We, we're not seeing oh. it yet. All right. All right. Thank you. It's considered a substandard lot because it is not 50 feet in width. So with the substandard lot, uh, we've got additional lot restrictions, lot coverage, floor area, that sort of thing. It's also on Westcliff Drive. And that has uh, another overlay of restrictions. So it's a it's a pretty restricted lot for development. Uh, the proposal is to construct a new about a 2,900 square foot house, two stories. It's going to have um, a detached 400 square foot garage. And where's my layout? It includes a um, three bedrooms, uh, three baths, a living room, a bar area. Um, in a family room. So the zoning administrator heard this item on, 
November 7th agenda. And at that hearing, there was five people that spoke in favor of the project. Uh, the appellant was there. He lives to the east of the property right here, or he owns the uh, duplex to the east. And he spoke against the uh, project. Um, one of the concerns that are in the minutes of the ZA uh, meeting was the two stories adjacent to the one story. Um, uh, apparently a privacy um, issue came up. One of the conditions or the condition that the zoning administrator <coughs> added was to increase the hill, the sill heights in the uh, bedroom that would be adjacent to the existing house. Um, so uh, Mike Brodsky is the um, appellant that uh, owns the property to the east. He submitted his appeal letter. I attached it to your report. And it seems that the emphasis on um, the appeal is adding the second story adjacent to a one-story house. And also there was uh, some issues with the heritage tree stuff. So I'll just go through these slides and get us to where we're going. So the zoning in the whole area is R15. It's also all in the appealable coastal zone. So these kinds of permits require coastal permits as well as design permits. Um, this is the appellant's uh, duplex that is adjacent. And you can see the house directly uh, north of his is two stories. This is the project site itself. This is the adjacent duplex. And then um, these are the heritage trees. So uh, that's all also part of the appeal is that the um, our, our urban forester on a uh, chose to be conservative and wanted to include one heritage tree removal permit. And that's basically to remember or to remove this one branch and it hangs over the property line and that'll interfere with construction of the detached garage. The rest of those trees, uh, according to the Arborist report, are dead. And the one tree to be preserved is, uh, I think it's about five or six feet north of the property line. So we have um, mitigation measures to preserve that uh, as part of the conditions of approval. So the house directly across the street uh, is the stone house on Westcliff Drive. Just north of that is another two-story house. And again, the, um, the lot to the north of the duplex lot is shown here. And the house above that was also two stories. So I don't have a good slide of it here, but this duplex lot has a little area back here that fronts on uh, Stockton Avenue. It's kind of an L-shaped lot, the adjacent lot. Um, and that's, that's why the house to the north, it's kind of far from the duplex uh, because of that yard area. I don't think it's that far, but it's because that yard area is an L odd shaped lot. At any rate, um, looking at the site plan, we've got the detached garage in the back that meets its setbacks. The first floor of the main house is five feet away. Uh, the second floor is seven and a half feet away. Um, meets the street side yards. Um, again, it meets the R15 zone district standards. The sub, um, the non, um, non-conforming lot uh, district standards in terms of floor area and the Westcliff Drive restrictions. So it's just here's a, a, the site plan with the landscape uh, layout. This is the floor plans. Um, ground floor is dining, um, one bedroom on the ground floor, kitchen area, family room. Second floor has two additional bedrooms. Uh, large balcony out in front of the master bedroom and in front of this bar area. It's the front elevation or the south elevation that would be facing West Cliff. Um, a lot of glass, uh, kind of a typical contemporary look for West Cliff Drive, smooth stucco finish, uh, metal seam roof. These are the balcony areas. And this is the elevation that's um, facing um, Michael Brodsky's property. And the condition that the zoning administrator placed was to uh, increase the seal height on this back bedroom window to 
help preserve some of the privacy. And you can see that the, the roof section there um, is, you can see that the second story is stepped back seven and a half feet, and that's the exposed uh, or the uh, metal roof area there. And Mike, if I could just jump in and jump in. back elevation. That's Increase that sill height, that is the ingress egress window, and there's a closet in that bedroom on the north wall. So just so that the applicants are aware um, that um, to comply with that condition and still meet the ingress egress requirements that are required for the building code, they would either need to move the closet and put that on the backside. Um, uh, that's that's likely the solution that would need to be um, I implemented in order to achieve that increased sill height. So it may remove a window from that wall in order to meet both the permit condition and the um, building code requirements for maximum sill height to allow for people to exit through a window should there be a fire. So there are um, uh, additional design implications associated with uh, that condition that was added at the um, zoning administrator stage. Just wanted to make that clear for both the commission and for the applicants and appellant. Thank you. Mm, so that's the west um, elevation of the building. Again, smooth stucco, um, columns, balconies, and that's the rear. And this is the uh, detached garage. So the West Cliff Drive has the uh, building envelope restrictions, and you can see here that um, it meets those restrictions. And uh, so the, the drawing shows the uh, height at 30 feet, and in the staff report, I'm telling you folks that it's, whatever I said, 26 feet and some change. And the way we measure building height isn't to the actual top of the building, it's an average of the height from grade to the highest plate, and then from grade to the highest peak. So that average height comes out to whatever I said in the staff report, I forget, 26 or 27 feet. So it's a couple feet less than what you're allowed to have. And it's just another angle. Um, and it's the, the front of the lot kind of curbs steeply, so they took two shots, one from the edge of the property line to show that this section of the building meets the envelope. And then in the center of the lot, they uh, took another angle to show that the rest of the house uh, meets that envelope. And then here is an artist rendition of what the house will look like. And that's uh, from West Cliff. And that would be from um, Michael Brodsky's property. And again, those are the, the windows that have the uh, condition on them. So. I forget exactly uh, when this was, and I meant to look it up again. I think this uh, was approved about eight or nine years ago, and this was also a two-story house on this uh, property, and I think during the economic downturn, um, the uh, homeowner uh, walked away and never constructed the plans. This one was a little different. They had a small section of the house that was five feet from the property, but then the two-story elements here and here, they were seven feet away on the ground floor and above. So the second story element was seven feet away. Uh, portions of the first floor were um, at seven and a half feet, I believe. And then this would have been the east elevation. So this did get approved at the zoning administrator and this was good for three years after that approval. And it was kind of an eccentric design. It had a metal, this is all metal, um, almost netting that was, that was covering the building. It, it was pretty eccentric. <clears throat> but it met all the um, zone district standards and the West Cliff Drive standards. So that was previously approved. That's what it would have looked like from uh, West Cliff. These were big metal screens. Excuse me, Mike, I wanna make sure I understand. Um, the previous project approved for the site, are you saying that it actually took up additional, uh, w went further out into the envelope? No, oh. no, it was within the envelope and it was within the setbacks. I, maybe I didn't um, explain it correctly. I just, I just, I probably just misunderstood. 
So the difference between uh, the project that we're looking at tonight is the first floor is five feet away on that whole wall. It's five feet away from the property line. In this project, they went back to seven and a half feet right here and right here, and then they went up a straight two stories. So the reason I'm bringing that up is that when we look at these um, non-conforming lots, uh, and we see the two-story argument next to the one-story. What we have done historically for the last 20 years, and I gave you um, several examples, and one that included the court case, mm -hmm. we want the second story to be placed typically just offset from the first story. So we want the side yard setback to be increased on these substandard lots. And that's, that's what we tell folks when they come in, and there's a lot of substandard lots in town. Um, there's no way that anybody would tell somebody you cannot have a second story on a substandard lot, but we want you to do something sensitive to your adjacent one-story house, and that could be anything, um, including setbacks. It, it could be frosted windows for privacy. We've seen all kinds of things. So I um, did include the uh, letter from the city attorney. I thought that was a pretty illuminating letter. It was hard to read. I apologize for that. That's the only copy I could get. Uh, but it did go into and uh, um, uh, explain to the council who had approved this project and then it went to court that this is the technique that we have been using. Um, so I have had no comments from the general public. We did get one letter from Reed Searle that you saw. And I always appreciate Reed's letters. Uh, and we got a letter late tonight from the applicant and I asked uh, that that be the appellant, I'm sorry. Um, and I asked that you guys were forwarded that and I think you got it. And then um, my, um, Boss, the planning director, reminded me tonight that we have new bird um, fenestration treatments, and we just kind of had a seminar last week, and it had skipped my mind. So I added a condition of approval, and I printed a copy out for you and for the applicant. The additional condition is that the applicant will work with planning staff at the building permit stage to include bird safe design measures for the portions of the fenestration of the home that have the potential to reflect the ocean. And that will be to the satisfaction of the zoning administrator. And what we learned is that if you have a really reflective window and you're near a, a body of water, birds think that they can go right into the ocean when they're looking at your window and they'll hit the bird or the window. And so there's a variety of things that you can do uh, to the fenestration so that uh, the birds will avoid the windows. So, and it's an active uh, or, or working on this uh, policy. It hasn't been finalized, but we'll be able to work with the applicant to come up with something. So with that, let me get back to my notes. Yeah, that's uh, it for my presentation. We're recommending that the Planning Commission uphold the zoning administrator's approval uh, and deny the appeal. And the appellant is here tonight. Okay, thank you. Could I ask you to put a picture up of the actual project? Just so we don't get confused. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us are old. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, do commissioners have any questions of staff? Seeing none at this time, I'm going to um, ask the appellant uh, to address us. You'll have 15 minutes, after which I will ask the applicant uh, to make any comments to us. Good evening. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Michael Brodsky. I live at uh, 1712 West Cliff, uh, next to the proposed project. And um, I'd like to start out by repeating uh, my welcome to Mr. Kumar and his family to our neighborhood. And by repeating my support for his plan to build a home on the lot. Uh, that lot has been vacant for quite some time and it's attracted littering and other unsavory activities. And building a home there will be a welcome addition to our neighborhood. Um, I'd also like to point out that I've never spoken against the project or contended that Mr. Kumar couldn't have a second story. 
Um, what I've asked for and what I'll be asking for again tonight is simply that he conform to the zoning code. And they're, they're just, it's very straightforward, black and white. There's two provisions of the zoning code that are not being met with this project. Um, before I launch into that, I would also like to just thank the, the city staff has been very helpful to me in this in providing documents and information and in particular, uh, Mr. Ferry has been very helpful and very patient with me and I do appreciate that. Um, so it's my home that's there. I mean, Mr. Ferry referred a couple times to a duplex. There are two small cottages on the lot. Uh, the front cottage is my home, which is 1,360 square feet. Uh, the rear cottage is 770 square feet. Um, I use that as a, for occasionally to entertain guests. I've never rented the property or operated it as a duplex. Um, the, the maximum height at the peak of my roof is 15 feet. Um, there's a handout there with two pages that shows a picture of my home. And my rough, I'm sorry, I didn't hire an architect and do fancy drawings. And whether it's 30 feet or 27 or whatever we said, that's approximately how the two things uh, stack up to each other. It, it's also important to understand that my home is the only adjacent home to this proposed project. My lot is an L-shaped lot, excuse me, that wraps around the property. So there are no other adjacent structures. The only adjacent structure is my home, which is a one-story home. Um, it, it's a big lot. I mean, I have a 10,000, it's over 10,000 square foot lot. It's got frontage on Stockton. It's got frontage on, on Westcliff. I recently uh, spent $65,000 putting on a new shake roof and painted the place and did a bunch of repairs. And you know, all my friends and family tell me I'm nuts. You should tear that thing down and you know, scrape the lot and build a, a 4,200 square foot McMansion there, which I probably could. Um, I think my home, small little home cottage, adds some character to Westcliff. Um, the tourists on Westcliff stop and go in front of the aloe plants that you see there in the pictures and take selfies of themselves with the aloe plants in my home in the background. So if that's any measure, if, it, if I'm adding anything to the community for whatever it's worth. So the two provisions of the zoning code that aren't met is uh, the one that says placement of second story elements adjacent to single story structures shall be avoided. No, excuse me. The first one is section 24.08.440 paragraph three, which says new structures shall be consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots and generally be compatible with existing surrounding structures. So the staff's findings only address the second portion, generally compatible with existing surrounding structures by addressing the stone house and other houses in the area. But my house is the only structure on an adjacent lot. And I think from looking at the picture you have there in front of you, compared to the rendering there, I don't really think those are consistent. Uh, the second requirement is that placement of second story elements adjacent to single story structures shall be avoided. Now the, the staff findings have said that they don't consider my home to be an adjacent structure for purposes of this requirement. So I looked in the definition section of your zoning code and there's no definition of adjacent structure and absent a definition in the zoning code, a specialized meaning cannot be attributed to adjacent structure. It's given its plain ordinary meaning. And anybody looking at the, what we've seen here tonight would agree I'm adjacent. I also saw the uh, city attorney's letter for the first time uh, yesterday, and that's very helpful to me because the city attorney interprets the previous court case from 2004 as imposing these, that these requirements of the zoning code impose two requirements. One is to minimize second floor footage. So that has not been done here. The opposite has been done. The way this home has been designed is ordinarily you have a limitation 
that the second floor can only be no more than 50% of the floor area of the first floor. But if you minimize the size of the first floor, then you get a bonus and you can maximize the second floor. And that's what's been done here. But that comes into conflict with the other zoning code provision that says we have to minimize square footage of second stories where it's adjacent to a single story structure. Where two provisions of the zoning code come into conflict, the more restrictive provision governs. And that's also stated in your zoning code in the general provisions. So at a minimum, that second floor bonus square footage provision cannot be taken advantage of in this situation. The second thing that the city attorney um, letter interpreting the court case said is that in this situation you need increased second floor setbacks. And we do not have that here. The Westcliff Drive overlay district requires a seven and a half foot second floor setback proposed design is a seven and a half foot second floor setback. So there has been no increased setback above and beyond the underlying zoning. So the net effect of this is that these two provisions of the zoning code do no work in the design of this home. They have no effect. They're surplusage. And it's just not possible for staff or anybody to interpret a municipal ordinance in a way that provisions are given no effect. Um, the other concerns are that, uh, as I say, I just put a brand new roof on the house. I'm planning to put some solar panels up there. And I think that this we need to consider how much of my solar access is being blocked by this. Another concern and why this is different from the previous home uh, that Mike made reference to that was approved, I, Mr. Tusatami, that was a number of years ago, and then he just changed his plans and he decided he didn't want to build it. So that was, that was the issue with him. But if we, could we possibly put up that other rendering that shows the It shows the garage. It's the artist concept that shows the east side and then it also shows the garage. There it is, yeah. So this is the east side. My home runs right along here. So that second story is above me for that length there. But then the garage is also pushed right back up against me. And the height of the garage is 15 feet and it's only shown as three feet off the property line. The previous design had the garage around in the front. So at least the backyard was completely open and I didn't have structures next to me, a two story structure and then the one, the one story 15 foot garage next to me for the entire length. So as the garage, as far as I can tell, is not violating any zoning provision, but moving the garage further out toward the street and perhaps putting a flat roof on it might mitigate some of the effect of the large structure and might be considered in an overall approach to redesign. Also, I think, you know, the second story needs to comply with the zoning code. And I think, you know, design revisions can be made so that it complies with the zoning code and there'd be a very nice house there and everybody can live happily ever after. And I, I just do want to reiterate that, that I'm not trying to block the project or say that the home shouldn't be built there. I'm simply asking that it comply with the law. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Are there questions of the appellant? Mr. Kennedy. How far from your house to the property line is that? I think it's five feet. Mr. Spellman. For the previous design, were you the neighbor at that point as well and you, you approved of that proposal? 
I was engaged with the impellent at that time, and one of the things that I engaged with him that gave me more comfort was that there was not a garage in the backyard, and I had that 20-foot clear space, and I was aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions of the appellant? Seeing none, thank you very much. Very thank thoughtful you for your presentation. Time. At this time, I'd like to invite the uh, applicant to make any comments, including rebutting the appellant's <coughs> points. Hey everyone, my name is Jagdish Kumar. I believe uh, this project, the new design, is way more beautiful than the old one. Personally, I take that design of the house 15 houses neighborhood, every single person love it. Not even single person say no good, except Mr. Nasty. And uh, I'm bringing good things, beautiful things, that neighborhood. And this is gonna be a, that house is, to me, I'm a builder. That is a beautiful house, and everybody love it. I show this house, this picture over the hill. I show those neighbors, they say, oh, honey, husband, wife, talk. Oh, honey, can we build something like that? We knock our single story. I mean, people excited to see this house. They dying to see this house over there. However, first a single story, Jason, to double story, that stuff is is wasting time. If that was the case, this cliff drive, nobody have double story house. And uh, this several house right now, new house going adjacent to single story to double story. So if I build a single story house there, Mr. Bernaski built two more year double story, then my complaint gonna go against the hand. Then he never gonna have a double story, I'm never gonna have a double story. That's not the way work. Long as you meeting city rule regulations, <coughs> you're fine, good to go. Mm. And I believe Mr. Michael, all his complaint is not valid. I believe very strongly. And uh, it's a beautiful house. All those neighbors, nobody have a problem. Everybody love it. And uh, other issue we have, there's a tree there. To me, the most important, the house, the building, anything in the world, most important, public and animal safety. We like to work, go home, one piece healthy, not to hospitalize. For me, as a builder, safety come to first, rest of things second. I don't care. Safety, 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 every single time. One of my friends helping me put some two by four against the fence. When he stand, the tree hit his head, open this much. He have a four month off work, he's not doing good still. His sister come in the property, taking picture. Mr. Bernaski, go there, talk to her. Oh, this is Jack Tree. Go ahead and sue him. He should pay all the damage, according to them. That's their statement. In the complaint, he invented that. That's his tree. If you read that, he's a complaint, and he's invented that. That's his tree. There's a survey already done the property. According to the survey, those tree into his property. They're over like this umbrella, which is you guys see the picture. And I try to cut those trees from my property line straight up several times. I make an appointment with him. He cancel, cancel. Oh, let, give me, let me some more, more time. Let me talk to this guy. Let me talk to this guy. Let me talk to this. Let me talk to this. He never let me cut. I believe the state of California law, wherever in your property straight line, you can cut it, especially they're unsafe, they're dead. And that's crazy. And he want to save those dead tree? 
That's ridiculous. And people can get hurt. If he let me take it, those three long time ago, my friend, he should be perfectly healthy and he should be go to work. Hey, his family be happy. And I don't know what's gonna happen to him because he aware that, that problem. And there's a several bitterness. I make appointment to clean up the mess. He don't let me do that because he's attorney. He's threatening all those neighbors. Oh, if you mess with me, I sue you. All those neighbors against this gentleman. I talk to every single one. They say, all those neighbors told me if any issue legal with this person, be a right behind you. And uh, once again, like I said, those three, I don't have to cut from property. I have right to cut where my property line is <laughs> for safety reason and also my building reason. And uh, far as I concern, my project's beautiful. I really appreciate it if you guys approve. And uh, far as I concern, this is wasting time. And uh, his complaint is not valid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do commissioners have questions of the applicant? Oh. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry about that. I thought, sorry to bring it back up. Any, any questions of the applicant? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you very much for thank coming. You. And with that, um, I will, uh, this is a public hearing, and I will be, um, I, excuse me, I think we're done with okay. your Very comments. Um, you know, I, th I think we did hear from you adequately. I'm gonna try to move the meeting along. Uh, I, I thought, I don't think so. I don't know. Not in the procedures. I mean, I, I don't have a huge problem with it. We don't have a lot of public Sorry. comment. Okay, I'll grant it. I never told anyone to sue Mr. Kumar. And in terms of the trees, uh, the way I left it with him, we had an agreement that he was gonna hire an arborist and that he would let me know when the arborist would be there and we would meet together with the arborist. And instead of that, he went there with the arborist, wrote the report and submitted it. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm ready to meet with him and the arborist and figure out how we can deal with the trees. Thank you. Uh, I, this is a public hearing. I'm seeing no members of the public here uh, to address us, but I will open up the public hearing and I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Um, thanks for the presentation, Mike. A question about, can you talk, uh, can you share some comments with us about the the appellants, um, the, the whole adjacent property, uh, the way I read Mr. Uh, Brodsky's, Mr. Brodsky's letter was that, that staff doesn't, review, doesn't view his property as adjacent and that he does. Can you help us with that? Oh, his, his property is adjacent. What we're saying is that the second story, because it has an increased setback, is not considered adjacent. That's that's the whole argument that the city has used for the last 20 years. The second story is not adjacent. So, um, citing two um, codes that are not, that this project is not consistent with and According to um, the city attorney's interpretation, the superior court's um, ruling, uh, this is consistent. Mm -hmm. And that's just um, difference in interpretation, in your opinion? Sorry? Difference in interpretation, is that what explains? That, uh, I mean, why is, why is uh, you're saying it's consistent and Mr. Brodsky's saying it's not, it's just a difference in their interpretation you'd get? Yes. Okay. And I would also point out that the language says uh, shall be avoided. It doesn't say prohibited. 
Um, so there isn't a absolute prohibition there. And uh, I would say that there is the discretion lying with the planning commission to make that interpretation. And um, according to the uh, reviews of prior projects, that is how the interpretation has been made in the past is with an additional uh, setback that um, the uh, second story is found to be compatible with the surrounding area. and. Uh, that is is one way in which the adjacency is avoided, um, and uh, again, it's it's a discretionary call on the planning commission's part. Thank you for clarifying, Mr. Spellman. Yeah, I'd like to clarify that point even further. So, I think Mr. Brodsky made an even broader point. So the this project without looking at adjacent parcels is meeting the standard to allow the design as proposed, right? The second story is set back to the seven and a half feet. The first floor is at five feet, meets all the view planes from, from West Cliff. Um, but the way I understood the 2004 court ruling was that the only reason that, that was denied was because there were can additional conditions placed on it, additional setback, right? Right now we're at the current setback. We haven't, we haven't given additional setback, right? For jump in if I'm not interpreting that correctly, right? He would be, this design, this, any house is gonna be required to be at seven and a half feet for that second story going in, regardless of the design. No. No. No, it could, you could be a substandard lot and you could go straight up on a five foot setback. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. So now we're talking about if you've got the area on the ground floor at the certain percentage, you're allowed to go straight mm -hmm. up on the on the second floor, essentially. Um, maybe I didn't understand your question then. I'm just trying to follow that thought through. So m my point is, it complies without talking about the adjacent lot, which I think is an additional constraint for this property, right? The single story on the adjacent lot, everything else being equal, you can't ignore that fact. So I don't see anything in the design that is addressing that fact specifically, right? There were conditions on that 2004 property that reduced the massing on the second story. So it took square footage out, increased setback and provided somehow increased solar access. I don't know exactly how that played out, because I didn't see any drawings. I just read the, the description. But those three components were part of that ruling. I think it, it, it increased the setback from the existing house because that was so non-conforming. It met the setback requirements for the zone district. So I think they described in that. Uh, I think that's the crux of the matter, because I didn't read it that way. And if, mm -hmm. in fact, that's the legal determination, because before it was existing non-conforming setback for the single story structure right. that was gonna be demolished and, and rebuilt. Then the new proposed one, in fact, in this case, even had a variance, right, to set back on top of everything else. Street uh, side yard set back, yeah. And is it that same side that we're talking about that's adjacent to the single story home? That was a street side yard, so that was adjacent to a um, street. Okay. So I guess I'm looking for clarification from staff that some recognition of that single story adjacent structure has been addressed. And if you're telling me going back to seven and a half feet is what is addressing that condition, then that's, that's what I wanna hear. Yes. And the privacy windows. And the privacy windows, okay. I'm curious then why the, the windows for the, let's call it the bar room, those were not required to be raised or somehow obscured as well. Which room? Looking at that rendering right there, the bedroom window is the small window on that elevation, right? On the second story. <laughs> no, looking at the four. This is the bedroom window. Right, I'm looking at the four windows to the left. Yeah, those weren't required to be reduced. I think that, um, that Mike's house probably starts right about here. So the privacy issue was, was gonna be coming out of the bedroom. The back of the house. 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. Other other comments from commissioners? <clears throat> Sorry about the voice. <clears throat> Any other okay, so <clears throat> if, if I'm going to go back to that same issue, um, it sounds like the question of the um, adjacency at the back of the house, it's because it is the, it's an additional setback plus the other mitigation is that the windows have been raised? Correct. Uh, so that's how that's been addressed. Yes. And that additional setback on the second floor, it's a requirement right. of the Westcliff Drive plan. So if a substandard lot is in any other R15 zone district other than Westcliff, that seven and a half foot wouldn't apply. We would apply something to a second story adjacent to a one story. And again, it would either be, you know, set back farther than the minimum or we don't want to see, uh, we want to see privacy windows on that side of the house. Those sorts of things are what we look at. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so for me, that's a conflict, right? So that tells me it's meeting current code. It's not going above and beyond setback because of the adjacent single story structure. That's the way I would interpret that, right? You're meeting, you're meeting setback right now. You're not, you're not giving any benefit to that existing single story structure. That's the way I would read the code. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be proven otherwise or told that there's something I can sink my teeth into that says that's not the case. On Westcliff Drive, it already is a requirement to be seven and a half feet for the second floor. So whether so, you're substandard or not. Right, okay. Right, so that's that's correct. Your um, y your analysis is correct. It's it's meeting the setback. It's got like an inch and a half or something additional, right. on, but it's right. meeting the setback. So you wouldn't place an additional requirement to address the single story adjacent structure. This is my question. I think the, the privacy window is probably the additional thing because it was brought up at the public hearing. I wouldn't require anything more than the seven and a half foot side yard setback. If it became a problem at the hearing, then the zoning administrator well, I guess the, has the okay, authority. So then my rub is, so why does the zoning ordinance specifically call out single story adjacent structures? And we just say we don't have to address those because it's what we've done for 20 years? That answer doesn't work. Okay. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, right? I mean, I'm thinking of being in both people's shoes here. We want a solution that works, but we want one that also addresses the code in, in some manner. Sure, and I would say that um, the um, approach that would be taken if this were not in the Westcliff Drive, it would be to put in a solution similar to this with the additional two and a half foot setback. And so this is meeting the code and it's also meeting what we would apply in other areas. I think um, one of the, just throwing things out there, um, you know, one of the concerns that I heard from the appellant here was the location of the garage. Um, that is something that, um, you know, certainly the, the commission has the ability to say, for example, um, set the second story back an additional foot or two feet or whatever it sees as um, uh, appropriate to address that interface. You also have another option um, that is not, that they're not mutually exclusive. You could do one or the other or both. Um, but hearing the neighbor's concern about the location of that garage, the driveway length is roughly 25 feet and um, it's a 20 foot minimum driveway length. Is that correct? So, you know, you would have the ability to um, set that garage back further um, and, um, still meet the applicable criteria um, that would help to address some of uh, the appellant's concerns. And uh, so just putting options out there. And um, I, again, this is uh, all up to the Planning Commission's interpretation of how they would like to address these. Um, and uh, we're bringing some of the, um, the ways that it's addressed in other districts for uh, the Commission's consideration. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go I'd like to in. ask the appellant to come back to the podium. I, I'm not inviting you to um, 
I'm inviting you back, but I had a couple of specific questions, not inviting you to make a, a full presentation, but what have you, uh, what would you wish for with regard to the second story setback and the garage? Well, as far as the second story, there's two things. There's the additional setback and there's also minimizing the size of the second story. So again, there's, we have, there's a specific zoning code requirement of an additional setback. How much more would you like to see? Two feet. Have you told that to the applicant? I haven't, we haven't had the opportunity. Um, you know, the original outset was he showed me the plans very quickly and I, this is months and months ago, I tried to suggest, well, could we do this, could we do that? And I was told, no, I'm not making any changes. So perhaps the most productive thing would be, and I don't know if it's a possibility here, but what you mentioned before was to continue. So he and I and planning staff could sit down and see if we could come up with something acceptable because there, you know, there are two factors on the second floor. One is that, that there's a specific requirement that the second floor square footage be minimized and that has not been done. It's been maximized. An additional setback would not necessarily reduce the, the square footage of the second floor depending on how his architect went, it went about it. The second point is the setback. The third concern is, is the garage and my desire would be to just have his backyard there and have the parking around the front. If that's not possible, perhaps a flat roof on the garage and moving the garage away a bit might mitigate some of my concerns from the main house. Although it is not necessarily a requirement that he do that with a garage, some compromise on the garage might mitigate some of my other concerns. And I think the way to address that is to, to sit down around the table with his architect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I can, I can continue the dialogue as, as long as I like with it. Oh, can we go through the chair, but you know. Can I not? not sure, you could ask okay. another question. I'm, I'm done. I just wanted to see if I had the right to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I generally go through the chair, but I mean, that's okay. Yes, you can see, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, are there any points? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to discuss that issue a little further. So the notion of minimizing the second floor square footage, when and how is that triggered and, and how has that been addressed in this project? Um, <clears throat> it's in one of the findings on the substandard lot, I believe. Let me see if I can find it. I think I see it on your page four of the agenda report. I'm thinking it's a finding. Oh, where? Under substandard? What are you looking at? I guess I'm just looking for clarification on what, you know, how, how does staff see this? He made the point that, is it is it based on the fact that it's a substandard lot that the, that the code suggests that you minimize the second floor square footage? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, he could be talking about there's a finding, uh, it's number 33. It says the floor area of second story shall not exceed 50% of the first floor except in cases where the first floor constitutes 30% or less coverage. And that's a, a regular calculus, calculus that everybody goes through when they're looking at a substandard lot. You can do it two ways. You can maximize the first floor at 45% and then you get half the floor area on the second floor or you can put 30% of the allowable floor area on the ground floor and then you can have an equal amount on the second floor. Right, I understand that that's a very clear component of the code, right? There's criteria, if you meet it, you go up. This is, I don't know if it's more ambiguous, but I'm trying to find the code section that is, is, is telling you to limit the second floor square footage and maybe, yes. What number? What's the finding? Could you just give us the reference, please? It's in the city attorney's letter interpreting the court case. Thank you. Oh, okay. And what it says is, I'll just read it and then sit back down. Uh, in addition, the council found that the two-story rule cited by Mr. Weiss did not preclude the city from approving a two-story house adjacent to a one-story house 
in the Seabright neighborhood, rather simply required the city to sensitively site second stories with increased setbacks and limited square footage. So that's the court's interpretation of the adjacent single story house restrictions as reported by the city attorney. And the, the finding that corresponds to that is finding number 33. And again, it gives you a choice. It's restricting the floor area on the parcel because it's a substandard lot. And there's two ways to do it. There's a 30% with an equal second floor or 45% with half the floor area. Okay, so you think that the, our language is already the limiting factor for the second story square footage? I think that finding is. Okay. And that's, that's a finding specific to substandard lots. Right. Okay. All right. Does anybody want to make another comment on this? I, I know for myself, I find the um, staff's analysis um, fine. I think that it's that it has met those requirements and I, for, for, to my mind, the, it makes sense. Um, and it, I, um, I'm, I also think that there's, a, there's been some um, enough mitigation so that I think it's conforming. So I think we've got basis to deny the appeal. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any discussion that they want to add. I agree, I'm ready to make a motion. Go ahead. So I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Commission deny the appeal, upholding the zoning administrator's acknowledgement, et cetera. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Yes? Yeah, I, you know, I appreciate the appellant making these points as well. I think we've tried hard, at least on the five years that I've been on this commission to write code and make things as flexible as possible, which doesn't always result in straightforward and clear answers as we are finding out in cases like this. Uh, there are some things that are left to interpretation. And I think I'm, I'm satisfied at this point that they're meeting the intent of the code with, with this design. Thank you. Any other discussion? Just a question about the motion is that Understood to include the additional one offered by staff, or do we need, do we need to add understood that? Understood too. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only thing I want to add is that I wish, as a commission, we could uh, start this off on a better neighbor relations, but that's not what we can do as a commission. So, beyond our scope. If we could, I, w I would try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> additional. Do have comment. one more general comment. This isn't meant for the appellant or the the design that's in front of us, but we have a design permit on a very prominent piece of property and we still don't have even a site plan that shows one existing structure, right? We have two lines that show half of Mr. Brodsky's property, but we don't have a site plan that shows an adjacent parcel. This is not a critique of you. This is hopefully something for future projects and we as a city need to change our ordinance so that the requirements for a submittal include those components. Um, a section showing us this relationship. This, this view and a critique of the, the renderings that are shown, if you can't show a rendering that is accurate, don't show a, a montage that isn't in scale with, with the image that's being presented. Um, this image could never exist, right? You're standing in Mr. Brodsky's living room in this view, right? Uh, so you can't show images that are trying to influence somebody's decision that aren't showing uh, reality, essentially. That's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tool to critique your design and look at the design, but when you throw it in context of a perspective and, and it's a reality, that I have a problem with that. And I think it's, uh, it should be something that we're able to look at and, and have all the information at our, 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 our useful moment, I guess, what I'm looking for. So it's 2019, I've been saying this um, for over a year, over two years. I think we need to find a path forward to get the language uh, included in our ordinance. Thank I you for that. I agree with Peter. Mm -hmm. I do as well. I was wishing that we could um, have it for the point of comparison as well. Mr. Singleton, did you have a comment? I agree with Mr. Spellman. It would be nice to have some contextual pictures. Oftentimes people come 
even people who are trying to you know, speak against projects and bring misinterpretations and out-of-context pictures. And so having a standard upon the application process seems like a worthy, a worthy section of code to have. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? With that, I'll call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Singleton? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Pepping? Aye. Ms. E. D. Miller? Aye. Chair Conway? Aye. Thank you for your um, attention and careful consideration. Motion carries. It's a bit late. I've been carrying around. <laughs> Okay, with that, we will uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is information items. Um, before we move on to the planning director's report, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the final meeting of Commissioner City Miller and Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, express my thanks for your diligent service in the time I've worked here. It's been a pleasure getting to work with, with both of you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your time and dedication to pushing things forward here. Your contributions have been well respected and uh, you know timely and, and always thoughtful. Thank you. I just want to say I appreciate your cheer and your approach, both in thoughtfulness and humor. Um, and I've appreciated uh, your perspective on pretty much every item we've discussed. So it'll be it'll be hard to to be here without you guys, and you'll be sorely missed. I'll just add a thanks and say I've learned a lot from both of you. Appreciate it. Right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. If there's any ad hoc committees or subcommittees, <laughs> you know, you guys know my number. <laughs> I'd like to uh, start off the director's report just with also an acknowledgement and a gratitude for the eight years of service that both of you have provided on this commission. Um, not only have you given uh, countless hours of your personal time, both outside of the meetings and inside the meetings, but uh, you uh, and the, the commission as a whole um, has, has really uh, given very detailed thought and I, I really have appreciated the um, commitment that you all have brought to this and the preparedness that you've brought to each meeting. And so I wanna share that the, the city is definitely better as a result of your uh, volunteer volunteerism and uh, your direct work on this commission. So uh, sincere thanks for all the work over the past eight years. I've only been a part of a couple of them, but uh, I know that uh, those have been very productive and uh, that you have uh, certainly contributed a lot during that time. And I'm sure uh, the same was true for the many years before. I'm afraid we just missed our chance to get that bike share station back, didn't we? <laughs> I'll leave yeah. on that, leave <laughs> with that. It'll, it'll perk up in a couple months. It'll be back. <laughs> um, okay. So I did want to um, just update the commission on a couple of items. Um, uh, updates regarding council actions um, that are either uh, recently, that have recently occurred or that are upcoming. Um, back in uh, mid-November, this commission heard the Pacific Front Laurel project um, going from Taco Bell up towards the Metro station with 206 or so residential units. And I wanted to report that the city council did approve that project on uh, December 11th. I am also um, wanting to let you all know that there has been a lawsuit filed against that project, um, citing uh, concerns with uh, CEQA and uh, also uh, not only the inclusionary requirements for that project, but the inclusionary ordinance approvals that um, went to this commission in the August timeframe and went to the city council in the September, uh, September 25th meeting, I believe. So just wanted to make you be aware of that. Um, and then um, finally, um, you uh, discussed the accessory dwelling unit provisions. We talked about them briefly as part of one of the items this evening. Um, they uh, came before this commission in mid-October and they have subsequently been in front of the council three times and um, they've been continued three times because there's been a lot of um, uh, discussion on other items that has uh, extended those agendas and precluded the uh, ability for the council to consider those. And 
And um, this coming Tuesday, there is a time certain, um, 3.30 p.m. for those accessory dwelling unit changes. So we're looking forward to getting the, the council's take on those. And we appreciate the, uh, the commission's um, very thorough review of those and wanted to make you aware of the timing for the council decision. That's all I've got for now. Okay, thank you. And do we have any subcommittee or advisory body oral reports tonight? Well, I don't think so. I had a question about subcommittees. I, do we have vacancies on a subcommittee? I guess we'd address that at a later meeting. Well, we do have the... Um the vacancies. Yes, the community meetings, uh, the commission had elected several representatives and I believe Commissioner Kennedy was a part of that. And I believe Commissioner Mark McCity Miller was also a part of that. And so with the um, next uh, meeting that we have, we will um, agendize an appointment for additional um, representation on those. And as a reminder for the commission and for the view uh, three planning commission subcommittee members um, attend the community meetings for select projects, the large or significant uh, projects, and then report back to the commission with uh, uh, those findings, particularly as that project moves forward to be heard in front of the commission. They can bring that perspective of the community into the conversation. Okay, that was worth noting that we'll also have those vacancies. Okay, with that. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.